Good morning, and, and thank you for being here. We'll get started because we have two sessions that we need to fit in, and some of us at least have to make airplanes in mid-afternoon. Uh, I'm Sanford Unger, director of the Free Speech Project at Georgetown, and this is our third day, partial day today, of uh, sessions in this Free Speech Symposium. As I think most of you have heard, the first of four that we are planning to do around the country, the first one in St. Paul. Uh, we're going to leave a, a, a little time in between them because we really, really had a quite a hectic, busy time. I really uh, just want to introduce <coughs> our welcomer for the day, my, I now, someone I now consider my colleague, Rebecca Neal, when we, when John McCabe and I started uh, working on this, my colleague project. Um, we were referred to, uh, to Hamlin University as a place that would be receptive to this idea and uh, then referred by President Miller to a person she said would be ideal to help us get organized and oriented and figure out how to, how to do all this. And Rebecca Neal has turned out to be much more than that. Um, she's really should be considered the, the the co-director of this event. She has put so much time and energy and effort and kindness into it, and we're deeply grateful. And uh, just have asked her to welcome us for a, a few minutes today. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you very much. I just want to uh, welcome everyone today. I, um, before I get started, my remarks will be brief. My pastor says, I won't keep you long, and I won't keep you long. Um, but I just want to echo Sandy's sentiment and thank Hamlin University, thank President Miller, um, also thank the Knight Foundation for having uh, the vision for the Free Speech Project at Georgetown and then also having the vision for Hamlin University to be the first regional conversation of many to come. I also want to thank um, the President's staff uh, Ann and Betsy, they also were helpful. Um, I can't thank Sandy and John enough for the collaboration and the opportunity um, for Hamlin and myself to work with them, the people that, we, that I've met. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity. I also um, have to acknowledge the conference events managements and thank yous are important, especially you know when we're talking about free speech. Um, I, have to thank conference events management, Kelly, um, for helping. Brian came on Sunday. I don't. I think. I think Brian like sleeps here at Hamlin. This is Brian. Um, so he probably has two homes. Hamlin is one of them. Um, but I just want to thank um, Brian personally for coming on a Sunday and setting this up, making um, it a warm, welcoming place for us. I also um, want to thank Sylvester. There's a lot of time and effort and energy that went into um, organizing the event and setting it up. So I just want to thank, thank Sylvester as well. Um, also, I want to thank the panelists. Some are here today. Um, I want to thank the panelists that were here um, on Monday and that were also participated on Tuesday. The panelists and the moderating I thought was excellent. And most importantly, I want to thank each of you for um, taking time out of your day to be here. I want to thank those people that are um, online that have joined us virtually as well. So in welcoming you for the final day of the Free Speech Symposium, um, lots of things were um, flooding in my head in terms of um, what I want to share. I think uh, free speech is important. It matters to all of us. What um, struck me as um, intriguing, I'll say, was that the first day we had a very spirited conversation about uh, free speech. And uh, not everyone agreed in the room, uh, but we were able to have a civilized conversation about free speech. And that matters, um, that matters. I think it's important for all of us to be good human beings, regardless of where we stand um, in this spectrum of free speech. 
we heard different representations of free speech the first, um, the first day and how free speech can be represented in media, free speech can be represented in localized interactions between uh, people in the community and police, free speech can be localized in classrooms, we um, heard that, you know, was alluded to yesterday, free speech um, among library books and um, in classrooms and in education. And so as we think about free speech, one thing that I felt like held true and was interwoven in the symposium that I just want to leave you with is the importance of responsibility with free speech. We certainly all have a right and we are entitled to our opinions. We have a right and we are entitled to our perspectives. And it is important to understand that the old um, phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words do hurt and words have an impact. And as we engage in free speech, I think it's important what was talked about the first day of this symposium was the responsibility that goes with free speech. And so I just want to leave you with that, with the notion of responsibility and free speech. Thank you. Hey, good morning. I'm Jeff Young. Thanks, first of all, to the organizers. Um, thank you so much, Rebecca, for, the, um, for setting up this panel and for the Free Speech Project. Um, I'm, uh, I'm a reporter and an editor at a publication called Ed Surge. We are a national nonprofit um, newsroom, and we cover all stages of education and especially focused on education innovation. And um, I also host our weekly podcast, the Ed Surge Podcast. But I'm honored today to be to be moderating this session, um, which on this super important, um, but also of course um, complicated issue and nuanced issue of viewpoint diversity. And I think. Um, you're going to see we have an, a really um, wonderful panel up here with dis perspectives that are going to um, really help us kind of have um, a discussion, and we are going to leave time for questions, I believe, and, and, and let you all in on this uh, as we go. So please do be thinking um, yourself, and I'm hoping that we can, you know, jump in on each other and not have a super formal um, situation. So please, I'm reminding you all that, you know, feel free to jump in, or if I misstate, or, or if you want to just, like, you know, redirect, let's do it. Um, and let me let you know who's up here, um, first of all. I know that's in the program, but um, I want to highlight some things about everybody. Um, first, um, Deborah Applebaum, who is Appleman. I'm going to start again. First, <laughs> Deborah Appleman, who is a professor of educational studies at Carleton College. Um, and she's also author of the book Literature and the New Culture Wars. Um, and she asks in that book the question, can educators continue to teach troubling but worthwhile texts? Um, a former, you are a former high school teacher, oh, yeah. which is, a, a, you know, for what, eight or nine years before you were in higher ed. And um, your more recent work at the college level, you're teaching literature, creative writing courses, and even including at the Minnesota Correctional Facility in Stillwater and also in Faribault, and um, talking to incarcerated men who are interested in pursuing post-secondary education. So um, really interesting um, experience you're bringing here. Thank you. Um, Catherine K. Kokomont um, is Vice President for Student Affairs and Dean of Students at McAllister College. Um, she previously served as Associate Vice President for Student Success at Salt Lake City Community College, and you led institutional learning circles there focused on anti-racism, and you co-chaired task forces for, in, um, for increased institutional support for Hispanic, Latinx, and Asian American, Native American, and Pacific Islander students. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, Bob, um, Bob Groven, he's Assistant Dean of Faculty Development and Associate Professor of Communication Studies at Augsburg University. Um, Bob is one of the original founders of, and current director of the Minnesota Urban Debate League. And honestly, so we're talking about, you know, um, competitive debate among students. This spans high, you know, K-12 and college. And you have been doing this and including being a debate coach for more than 30 years. Um, so that is a really interesting perspective to bring to a discussion on viewpoint diversity. Um, and um, I thank you for being here too. 
All right, so um, I want to start off, and, and we have, I have a couple questions that I want to ask everybody. Some of the questions I'll just direct to one individual. And this one, though, just to, to, to get us started, I, w I wanted to take advantage of the, the long view that, that all three of you bring from being in higher ed for so long in education. And tell us what's different now about, you know, the students you see in classrooms. So starting off with the classroom view here at really high school and college. So I want to I wanna actually talk, start with you, Bob, about the debate world because, um, you know, that's, you think, you know, the place where viewpoint diversity would not be a problem or a, an issue at all. So what has changed over the last five, 10 years or, or whatever time frame you think makes the most sense in what you're seeing in, in competitive debate among students? Is it working? No. There we go. All right, great, thanks. Um, so I'd say from a structural perspective, uh, nothing has changed. So from a structural perspective, we still require, as a matter of how competitive debate works, that students have to debate multiple different points of view on a particular issue. Um, and uh, that's a fundamental part of what we think is extremely valuable about being a participant in debate either in the classroom or at tournaments or whatever forum. Um, I think what has changed over maybe the last 15 to 20 years um, from a social perspective is that we've had a consolidation of judges and coaches around points of view that are left of center, um, and I should say, I'm left of center, I'll just own that, so I'm left of center, and yet I find that there is less acceptability for arguments that are not from left of center. And that has, as a result, sort of limited the range of possible disagreement on important subjects. And what I find, I have a friend of mine from the U of Chicago who likes to say, you know, we do a great job of preparing conservative students to leave high school and college and go defend their views in the world, but we don't do such a great job of teaching uh, left of center students how to defend those points of view because we don't challenge them as often. Uh, and so that's, to me, that's a problem from a pedagogical perspective, and it's also a problem from a political social perspective. Actually, could you, I mean, is there a way you could paint the picture of like what a moment looks like, you know, before and after? Um, yeah, so for example, um, when I was in college and debating, uh, you would see a variety of arguments that would be made. Uh, I'll, I'll just pick an argument and maybe this seems outrageous to people, but sometimes in debate we, we pick outrageous arguments in order to be able to test whether the argument is any good or not. Uh, and so, uh, I remember in college the argument was made that environmental uh, damage is bad because it causes species extinctions. And so then there's a series of studies that were done by uh, two people named um, Simon and Kahn in which they made the argument that species should be viewed just as resources for human use and that um, from that perspective the extinction of certain species is not a problem because we have other species that can be substituted. So that's the kind of argument that used to be made that is no longer made. Um, likewise, there's a bunch of right of center sort of economic arguments that defend, say, capitalism, free markets, um, which uh, are sometimes made. It's not that they're never made, but they're made less frequently because of the perception that the judge pool is not interested in hearing them, is not going to be persuaded by them. That somehow picking a topic, the very choice of the topic, will lose you points. Right, it, or make it is, it the, is the yeah, concern. Make it less likely that the judge will think that argument is the better argument in the debate. Wow. Okay. Um, so I mean, that's obviously an interesting, uh, you know, um, anecdote within this this broader picture we're talking about. I, as again, on the classroom, but a different component of it. Um, Deborah, I'm curious. You know, you have been teaching literature literature for so long at Carleton. Um, and it sounds like even picking which books, um, you know, you're, you're someone, it sounds like, that is challenging students to think about, you know, views they might not have encountered, and literature often does that. So what have you seen changed um, in, in your classrooms um, in the last few years? Guns. 
dramatic pause for tech. Dramatic pause. Here. Um, so just to clarify, um, I was a high school English teacher, um, but at Carleton, I'm in the educational studies department. I do teach. So my big concern for what's happening to the teaching of literature has to do with the people that I call my thinking partners all over the country, secondary teachers, middle school teachers, even elementary school teachers who are really under threat, and that includes librarians as well. Um, if I think about what's changed at Carleton, and that was a kind way of kind of inferring that we're older, um, but if, when I think about what's changed at Carleton in the 37 years that I've been there, there are both external forces and, and, and internal forces. The external forces have to do with the conversation that the culture is having about cancellation, about what authors are okay, about what books are okay, about what content is okay. And this seeps into the college culture. Within the context of a classroom, and I need to preface it by saying, I love my students, I'm here for my students, they're the most important thing that I think about, but so much has changed. One of the things that has changed is something that um, some of us call the discourse of harm. So students come into the classroom extremely vulnerable and at the same time armed with a readiness to defend themselves against any perceived harm. And I cannot tell you how many conversations I've had with colleagues who are rethinking what they're teaching. Colleagues in the history department, in sociology and anthropology, in English, all over. People are anticipating moments of difficulty right, that are not unrelated to things that have happened here on this very campus, um, but also within the context of the dynamics between teachers and students. So on one hand, we teachers have our own version of the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm. None of us ever want to cause harm for our students. On the other hand, we believe that learning is and should be uncomfortable. So on the first day of my educational psychology class, I said, under a topic in the syllabus of saying those things that go without saying, um, my job isn't to make sure that you're never uncomfortable. Actually, my job is to make sure that you get uncomfortable with intellectually, with that kind of cognitive dissonance that will help you grow. Um, that's become harder to do. Um, one of the things that we can talk about later is um, I've experienced, and we talked about this a little bit, what I call a pandemic hangover, that for the students who did their first couple years of college in their childhood bedroom with their stuffed animals behind them, there was a a way of infantilizing that made them feel more vulnerable. They didn't come with a lot of the social interaction skills that you would expect people between the ages of 18 and 22 to already have. So those are among the changes that I've seen. No, oh, thank you for that. Um, and, and we're gonna get back to the, yeah, sort of why some of this is happening in a minute. But first, Catherine, I wanted to talk to, hear your views too on, on what, um, you know, what has changed um, in, your, your, in your role as, you know, involved with student life? And so I was thinking about this question clearly since we've chatted, and one of the things I thought about is I want to compare something that happened in my formal education with what I think is happening in our current um, uh, traditional age college students' education. So it wasn't until I was a PhD student in my 30s that I learned about the origins of Asian racism, like racism towards Asians in our country. That not where I learned about how Asian immigrants weren't allowed a pathway to citizenship, um, about how after the Civil War, um, when Southern plantation owners wanted to underpay um, black, you know, their black um, former enslaved um, people, like that they wouldn't work for those wages. So instead they brought in Asian immigrants from the West Coast who had been pushed out of those towns because of the 
anti-Asian sentiment and how it bred you know, discord amongst those two communities of color. I mean, I didn't know about the history of Hawaii and what we had done to have it become part of the United States. And I was, like I said, in my 30s. My brain was hopefully fully developed by that time. I had a lot of life experience on how to deal with these things that felt so personal and hard to grapple with and I was so angry about. And in high school, I wasn't taught those things. The cool thing right now is our students are coming with a totally different K-12 education. They might have been in AP, African Amer American History, maybe not in Florida, but in other places. Um, they might have already learned about what oppression is on a short-term basis, like through TikTok, right? The ways that they're learning about these things and are starting to grapple with what that means for society and what that means for who they as an individual is, is totally different than how I came into a classroom as a college student at 18. And, and I don't mean this in a diminutive sense, it's just true, their brains aren't fully formed yet. Their life experiences are still widening. This still might be the first time that they've encountered someone who's different than them, you know, depending on what communities they've come from. And so the way that they're interacting with this information now and the experiences that they're validating and have learned about as they come into their very first college course is so different. And we should be rethinking what mm -hmm. curricula is, is calling to them and challenging them. Um, and I also think that while I loved the, how you brought up the discourse of harm, there's also something called the ethic of care, Mel Nodding's, um, I didn't come up with that. Um, and I do think that the word harm is being defined really differently mm -hmm. by folks who've been in academia for a long time and our students who are just starting out in their academic path um, in higher education. The other thing I wanna be really transparent about, again, for, for our students who are coming in um, traditional age, is really what they're moving from is not only childhood to adulthood, but they're moving from school to education. And it doesn't mean that there aren't great educators in the K-12 system, and it does not mean that sometimes they're not just going through motions in, in college. But there is a really different investment, and there's a really different way that we're allowed to teach in college, um, and there's a different way even that we're hoping they're approaching the material and the experiences that we're providing on college campuses. Um, and so I think some of the things that have changed is the fact that they're trying to to move from a school system that's changing to also a higher education landscape that's changing. Um, so it might not just be the students who are in that. That's really interesting. Yeah, please jump in. So one of, the, one of the other ways, and so I was referring before in a way that I think is negative, but I wanna be clear that one of the most positive changes that has happened in the world of debate, and I think this reflects the world of all of higher education, um, is that there's a, yeah, sorry, we're just getting a little <laughs> feed, feedback there on the mics, um, is that we now include in the world of debate a whole set of issues that not only didn't used to be included, but we never even thought about including. So it used to be in the world of policy debate, it used to be about policy analysis. And the idea of identity, the idea of who the author is, the idea of um, whether or not your life experience impacts how you evaluate arguments, whether your life experience and how a system around you impacts whether you think one policy option is a good idea or another. We didn't used to do that at all. That used to be thought of as sort of out of bounds. Now it's absolutely center. So we talk about issues of identity all the time. And what I have seen over and over and over again is students find that not only educating, they find it liberating, they find it empowering, they find their own sense of themselves by reading about and exploring those issues of identity and then bringing them into the argument and asking how should this affect these larger sort of issues we are trying to debate about economy and society and law, that kind of thing. And so I, I think those are just super powerful. I mean, I know, like, I, I'm a gay man, I wish those issues had been included uh, when I was younger because that would have made an enormous difference to making me feel seen and heard and incorporating my point of view into issues where you might have said, ah, it's an economic issue, so that's not relevant, but it is relevant. That's so interesting. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask, um, and we can start with you, Bob, on, on the sort of the why things have changed. You touched on this a little bit a minute ago, but what, you know, what are some things driving, in your view, that, you know, change we all, you've all described? Uh, yeah, that's a, 
that's a complicated <laughs> answer. Um, uh, so I would say there's probably three things uh, rolling there. So one is simply that um, as a society, um, I, actually a long time ago I heard an interview with George Will, the conservative columnist, who said that you can sort of write the history of America by looking at how more people are at, given a seat at the table of American democracy. And I think that's essentially what we see <coughs> continuing to happen, that more people are getting a seat at the table, and as a result, their views need to be included. And that's happening at all levels of society, including in education, higher education, or in debate. So I think that's one. Uh, I think a second is that the diversification of the country, so just from a demographic perspective, the diversification of the country, um, but in particular, the diversification of higher education, because a huge number of the issues we see now are really be driven by who is in the classroom. If you roll the, you know, if you roll the clock back 100, 100 years, 150 years, higher ed is overwhelmingly white and male. And as a result, a lot of these issues simply, they didn't think were relevant because it wasn't part of their experience. But now we have, like at Augsburg, we have, I think it's, we're like 67% students of color now. That means that if we are not talking about this issue, those issues, we are not talking about those students' lives. Uh, so, and then the third piece is that there has been the a development of a large body of research and scholarship uh, and theory, which talks about why these things should matter not just to education, to pedagogy, but also to all the different realms in which we make decisions collectively as a society. Thanks. And, and Catherine, you, what do you think are some other underlying issues that have shaped this, these changes we've seen and how we talk to each other? Well, I think, I think that, I mean, we're seeing it everywhere, right? How, how our leaders are demonstrating how we deal with conflict is very, very important to, to our students. Um, and it might not always be that they can directly connect that, um, but it has normalized a lot of things. Um, and I do realize that the conflict was there before, before any changes in our political landscape recently. But I do think, again, this idea that we can be in our own bubble and that that's a good thing. That this idea of safe space versus brave space is how I talk about it with students of saying there's a lot of reasons that we want to be safe. There's a lot of harm that's being done out there in the world. And but do you always choose a safe space or are there times when you have energy and ability to choose a brave space? And how do you navigate doing a both and and kind of having it be a dance? Um, but I do think that with the way that the just things continue to escalate, students more and more are taught to just stay in those safe spaces. Um, those cultural enclaves, those racial enclaves, whatever it is, people who are like-minded in their political mindset. Um, and I think that's one of the things, even in, in a space like this, of being able to talk about how do we do this with civility is what I heard earlier. Um, I had student athletes over last night, and I said I was gonna be on this pan great panel with folks from Augsburg and Carleton. They were like, well, you make sure you win. And, <laughs> and I said, <laughs> you know, they were athletes. We're used to competing against. And Where's I said, the scoreboard? <laughs> and I said, you know, the fun thing I think about this discourse is that I don't have to win, right? I get to learn and I get to grow. And, um, and again, you know, within the athletics context, that made sense. But I also think a lot of us are taught to win now. Um, and are we taught to, to learn and lean, lean into that? I don't know. You know, and I think it was, I think it was you when we all spoke recently that talked about even tracing some of these ideas back before the pandemic the change in, in the in kind of viewpoint diversity, even to the OJ Simp you know, OJ Simpson trial, which, you know, I'm sure the, you know, the, the, it, people remember, but it seems long ago considering all the things that have happened since then. Could you talk a little more about that? I think that I think about oh, the OJ Simpson trial way more than I probably should. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think I think a lot about it. Um, and part of that's because I think about what it did to the 24-hour news cycle. Um, and I think that when everyone got their news source from the same place, it was really helpful. We were talking about the same quote-unquote truths. Mm -hmm. um, and there was also problematic things in there, right? Like you didn't have viewpoint diversity. You might not, the person telling you your news might not feel like someone you related to or came from your community. Um, but really with the proliferation of a 24-hour news cycle, it forces people to take sides and it forces people to jab and it forces people to commercialize news and to say that what I'm saying is truer than what you're saying um, and doesn't allow for multiple truths to live at the same time. Um, so 
I blame the O.J. Simpson trial. <laughs> I also want to, um, we, one of the things we cover a lot at Ed Surge is technology and its impact on the classroom and in other parts of our lives. And I, I just want to hear if anybody has any thoughts on how social media changes the picture. Mm -hmm. um, Deborah, do you want to start? I'm hearing a, 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 a nod. Um, mm -hmm. Um, so when you were talking about the 24-hour news cycle, I mean, when I was a high school teacher and, you know, forming identity is the primary developmental task of adolescents and of late adolescents. And if somebody was experiencing a social challenge or being bullied by someone in their third hour or in their homeroom, it was tangible and you could deal with it. There are people who are cyber bully bullied by hundreds of thousands of people that they've never met. You can change your identity in so many different ways on social media. There's this kind of echo chamber about all of your opinions that so that when you meet a person, including all of us behind us, or all of these voices, all of these memes, all of these posts that we've seen. So it feels like when I'm dealing with a classroom of 25, I'm dealing with a classroom of million thinking about what is in their heads. So I think social media has had a, a, both a enlightening and frightening influence on adolescents. Also, I tell my students um, at the beginning of every class, I want to talk to you. I don't want your screen up. Multitasking is a myth. And the idea, we were talking before about community and how important community is. And when we're in a public space, having a screen up keeps you away. Um, so that's another issue. Some of our colleagues are interested in artificial intelligence and what that's going to do to assignments. As a writing teacher, I think that you can make assignments that are um, Proof in a lot of different ways when you talk about the kinds of things that happen in real time. But we are in a kind of echo chamber. And when I was thinking about the way that um, Bob laid out all of these factors that have brought us where we are, I mean, I think that the cruelness um, and the kind of discourse that we're surrounded by in this country that young people grew up with has really changed in some ways what the classroom climate in higher education is. Yeah, uh, does anyone else want to jump in here before I jump into another topic? I don't want to <laughs> leave people out. Yeah, sure, I'll take, um, oh, all right, there we go. Um, so I think social media, it's interesting, in, in communication studies, whenever there's a new communication technology introduced, Everybody says, oh, this new communication technology is going to change everything, and it's going to replace blah, 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 all these other things. Almost never happens, right? Instead, what happens is we layer new technologies one on top of another. And part of what happens when we do that is we create this question of, does social media introduce new problems, or does it magnify old problems? And I think social media has probably done both, but it's mostly a magnifier. And so what it does is it takes the problem of bullying, for example, and it magnifies it, where it used to be you could be bullied by a few dozen people or maybe a couple hundred people, and now you can be bullied by millions of people uh, online, right? And I think also it's always was possible to withdraw into your own little bubble and to only talk to people that reinforce your point of view, but now it's possible to do that entirely by yourself on your own, sitting in your own room, thinking that you're having a social experience when you're not. You're really having a passive observer experience. Um, and I think as a result, one of the biggest problems is it creates a sense of isolation and loneliness. And I think for those of us who grew up without that technology, we've sort of layered it on top of other technology. But for our students who, you know, the iPhone came out in 2007, and think like my son was seven years old at the time, right? They've never really lived without anything else, so it has been their primary medium. Um, and that, I think, has actually had a developmental impact on how their brains formed, how their social relationships formed. Um, and that's, there was just a big study that came out from Cigna that said that um, uh, people that are below the age of 30 are twice as lonely as people that are above the age of 72. 
right? Why would that be, right? They ought to be at a prime period of social interaction, but they feel lonely because the social media technology has made them feel isolated in their own little bubble. No, thank you for sharing all that. I mean, it, it, it is so much, yeah, we talk about these digital natives, I think is one way to put it, but the, the difference there. Um, you know, one of the things that, that now that we've kind of, I think we've framed it pretty broadly, both in the classroom and the societal sense. Um, I, I'm curious about some solutions or strategies that, that, you're, that you're finding or hearing. Um, Deborah, I know, I mean, you wrote a whole book recently, you know, very recently on this uh, issue. Um, what, are, what are some ways that, is it, is this, is one of the keys kind of teaching critical thinking and, mm -hmm. or what, you know, how do we, how do educators kind of start to, to change the, the viewpoint issue here? Uh, so a, a couple of decades ago, um, a professor of literature, Gerald Graff, um, talked about teaching the controversy. So when you were talking about, you know, most people being left of center, sometimes we assume the positionality of our students and we make mistakes and kind of ignore. I mean, at Carleton, I would say the hardest identity to be is to be a conservative student who gets silenced because they're afraid that they're going to be censored. Um, so teaching the, the controversy, um, saying what's at stake, um, presenting both sides. So when you're teaching a book that's fraught or you're teaching a book because the, um, the author has been censored. So recently I've been working with some students um, and teachers at Henry High School in Minneapolis and they were going to um, offer a book written by Sherman Alexi who's been canceled uh, seriously um, because of um, his sexual misconduct allegations and admissions thereof. Um, he's a wonderful writer and in many ways irreplaceable for some of the work that he can do with kids. Um, so what the teacher did was to say, okay, we have the, these books, we have another class set of this book, or this book, or this book, and here's what I want to tell you. Some people think that this book shouldn't be taught, and here's a couple articles about why. Um, and then here's a couple articles about what this book is and some reviews. And let's read them, let's talk about them, and then let's have a discussion and then vote. So instead of the teacher a priori making some decisions, putting it in the classroom, whether it's you know To Kill a Mockingbird, another, bur another book with the problematic use of the N-word, um, instead of just saying, I can't teach this, or I can teach this and I'm going to ignore it. I gave a workshop at Anoka Hennepin once called There's More Than One Way to Kill a Mockingbird, where it's like, if you, sometimes teachers, especially English teachers say, I'm an English teacher. I mean, I'm, I don't want to be political. And I say, if you teach a book like this without troubling it, that's political. That's not my politics, but it's a political choice. So presenting both sides, teaching the controversy, and also giving the students an opportunity to opt out. So if they're feeling that the, content is so directly implicated in things that they're working on and parts of their identity um, that would be uncomfortable to negotiate in a public space to give them that option. But I do want to expand something that Bob said about identity because um, Rudine Sims Bishop, who writes a lot about literature, says that literature should offer both windows and mirrors. And even though identity work is so important for kids, what we don't want to do in higher ed is only hold up mirrors. And that will create a kind of solipsistic way of looking at the world that's not good for everyone. We need to be able to offer mirrors, but also windows as well. And that's one thing that I'm hoping to do in my work. Who wants to jump in next, Catherine? Yeah, so I love what you're saying because I was going to say something similar about offering choices. But the other thing I think to, that I think a lot about is 
who is built up and who has had a legacy of being built up and who they are and who hasn't. And I love the idea of windows and mirrors, but who has always had a mirror reflected back at them and who has only ever had windows. And I think that's really sometimes the crux of it is you're now trying to give options that are still inequitable, not because we are trying to reinforce inequity, but because society and their their the society they've lived in has been inequitable to them. Um, and so one of the things I think about a controversial book is, is can you deal with that controversy? Are you a healthier person to t have that conversation when you've already had things that reflect who you are? Um, and again, I really worry about the state of K-12 education by state because it's gonna be even harder, especially for those working in private institutions that have in students from all different states where people have had very, very different experiences. That's always been true, but I feel like it's just furthered. Um, but I do think that's the thing is, maybe don't start with the controversy because maybe some of our students now have only had to deal with the controversy and been taught the controversy. Maybe start first with the things that uplift and reflect. Um, so I agree with the mirror and the windows, but how do we sequence that? Um, how do you provide the choices? Um, but also I think one of the things with the controversy that I've noticed is the way sometimes we've also said that the emotion that's brought into spaces is somehow bad. Um, and I do, a lot of my work is de-escalation of emotion. I'll be honest about that. There's a lot of that that's needed. But I also think about how do we even set up the conversation to say it's okay to bring emotion into this, but let's talk a little bit more about what place that has because the emotion is really connected to the lived experiences that we wanna honor. Um, so I agree with all of that and think about the sequencing and think about um, the ways that are our students are going to be coming to us really differently from a high school. Um, the last thing I'll just say is, um, and this is just of course because this has been such a rich, rich conversation both before we were up here in front of y'all and now, um, but I really think there needs to be more bridges between the folks who are working outside the classroom and the folks who are working inside the classroom. Because what I also see is the less connected we are, the more likely it's going to be that a student's going to come to me and they're going to, because I'll tell you, I'm the person they come to when they're like, this <laughs> faculty member is problematic, I want out of that class. and occasionally there is someone who's problematic right but a lot of times it's like just needing to sit and say well what was problematic how have you talked about this or or what do we need to do to to you know maybe think about this in a pl way that you have agency um, but also if we're not in community with each other it is hard for us to accept influence from each other and hard for us to think about how to solve these really difficult and complex things together can I push a little more on just uh, asking how and just what do you mean by talking across you know different sectors you know what how many areas are we talking about just just within t educators within the same environment or do you mean even outside of the academy say or outside of schools what what is this vision how I'll put it is tenured versus non-tenured and the reason mm -hmm. is is because tenure and for all of the wonderful things that it is it also has made that population change less quickly than populations that are not tenured, right? Like there has also been a, a quicker change in diversification of staff, of non-tenured faculty. Um, and that's not, I'm not saying that, I'm not putting a value judgment on that. I am just saying that there is a lot of different ways that we can influence each other and even to be able to talk about like things like the, va like the value of maybe the classics versus the things that like are the things you might provide as choices, right? How often have you talked with a staff member about that? Or have you primarily talked with other other faculty colleagues? Um, for me, when I talk about like how I work with a stu with the students that are protesting, how often am I talking about that with other people who are in my same role at other institutions or work in my division at my institution? How often do I get to talk about it with a, a faculty member? And I think that those conversations are really what strengthen us to be able to grapple with these really complex things and continue to center the students that we are now seeing on our college campuses, both to uh, not unintentionally harm them and to provide that ethic of care. Yeah, uh, can I, oh, um, <laughs> just, could I just jump in there for real quick? Because I really want to agree with what you were saying about teaching people, that's students, but it's not just students, that's everybody, uh, yeah, teaching people how to understand, reflect on, and constructively use their emotions. Uh, when you are confronted with points of view, uh, people, situations that are different from those that you agree with or that you're normal. Um, I, I think there's a big problem that we have 
uh, especially with young people, where we tend to be pathologizing feelings that are perfectly normal, understandable feelings. And one of those really is about having an argument, right? So it won't surprise you that I think one of the solutions is we need to teach people to be much better at how you engage in productive arguments, how you can engage, not trying to avoid arguments, because we can't make people better at having arguments by avoiding arguments. We can only get people to be better at having arguments by having more arguments. But we don't want to have bad, destructive relationships where we're using an argument to tear somebody down, where we're using an argument to try to win rather than to try to figure out what do I think is actually true? What do I actually think is the better answer, right? Um, argument is a skill. The ability to have an argument in a productive way is a skill. It can be taught, it can be learned, and a huge part of that that we don't tend to talk about is the relational and the emotional impact that that argument has. I want you to have more arguments, but I want you to have better arguments, arguments that build the relationship. If you have a good argument with somebody, it's an intimate, revealing experience and ultimately can deepen that relationship. You can make a lifelong friend <coughs> by having a really great argument with them, right? There's almost nobody, in fact, that you have a deep relationship with that you haven't had a deep argument with, right? It's a marker of a good relationship, but we tend to put a negative label on it and we all run away from it, and that only makes the problem worse. I was gonna add two things, um, but now I'm gonna add three. <laughs> um, what uh, Bob just said about pathologizing feelings um, I teach a class called Teenage Wasteland um, yeah. that talks a lot about the ways in which we've pathologized um, <coughs> adolescence. Mm -hmm. And so when feelings come up, they're not bad, they're good. And part of it is this dichotomy that we have in higher education between the head and the heart. Mm -hmm. That it's been this purely intellectual exercise where the heart gets in the way but the heart and the head have to work together in ways and that we can't be afraid of that. When Catherine was talking, you know, it's like to be a partner with the student life division is something that we don't do very well. So the very worst thing that can happen to a faculty member is to have a student go to someone like Catherine and say, um, I'm having a trouble with this, with this teacher get me out of the class. We wish that we could have partnered earlier before that conversation happened. And I think there is still too much of a division between student life and academic divisions and that we don't, and I blame as part of the academic divisions, the academic divisions who don't view the members of student life as people who know as much, if not more, about how to teach and what kids need. The other thing is that you know there's a lot of controversy about anti-racist training and what people need and don't need, but most college professors didn't get trained as educators. They got trained in their discipline. I'm a teacher educator. I have students who are teaching at Harding High School, Johnson High School, Henry High School, South High School, and here's what I say to my students who came from privileged backgrounds. Nothing in your experience as a high school student is relevant <laughs> to what you're going to do now. You cannot superimpose who you were as somebody who landed at Carleton College, who never knew what it meant to struggle. That is not having any explanatory power for what it means to be a teacher right now. That's why we have a teacher education program but we don't have teacher training for professors. And as our classrooms become more diverse, that becomes even more important. What I'm hearing is it's not a media literacy critical thinking solves the issue. It's, a, it's really kind of a mindset shift somehow that, that maybe students slash faculty slash teachers slash everyone needs in how we think about, you know, what an argument is or means or uh, why why we should disagree, which which seems like a good time to ask. You'd think I would ask this really early in the discussion, but <laughs> what is at stake here? You know, the, the, you know, in the introduction, we did get at that a little bit, and obviously the whole point of this event is that it matters, but but how could, could you, 
articulate why having these debates and and disagreeing and and doing all this work of having the different viewpoints represented is valuable what's what's at stake yeah. bob do you want to start on this one with your debate kind of yeah lens? i mean because i'm i'm, I'm also a, a jd so from a from a legal perspective i think this is a thing that we have we have failed to make the case to students and to the american public about why viewpoint diversity matters um, it's something that i think we've just come to take for granted and so like the american first amendment is based upon this idea of a marketplace of ideas where there's a town square and everybody should be able to come to the town square and say their piece and then discuss their view with others. And for me, that means that viewpoint diversity is about quality of decision making. It is about our best way of trying to figure out what's the closest approximation of the truth, right? You wanna know what's factually right you want to know what the best policy option is. You want to know what the best economic policy option is. The only way you're going to figure that out is by testing those ideas against other competing ideas. And in the college classroom, the way I talk about it at Augsburg is, you know, if you sit in a college classroom and everybody in the classroom looks just like you and they come from the same background that you do, your ideas will not be tested. You will lack academic rigor, right? The quality of your education will be less if the diversity of your classroom is lower. Um, so from my perspective, education is at stake, the democracy is at stake, but I also think people's personal health and happiness is at stake um, because we cannot be happy if we are not able to engage those around us, especially those we love and admire, in a sincere discussion about what we really think about the world. Um, that is inherently isolating uh, if we do that. Someone else is going to want to jump in. I was just going to say, I mean, every like right. We're, this sounds so drastic, but I, in my mind, is true. Is it's humanity, right? And I don't just mean that in how we see each other. I also mean this in the wicked problems of the world. Mm -hmm. We have to have diverse ways of thinking, diverse ways of knowing, mm -hmm. diverse ways of being to solve those problems that are really are really going to possibly end humanity. And I think if we don't know, if we're not learning and in our communities, in our educational environments, how to work with each other, how to accept differences of opinion, that's gonna impact everything. It's gonna impact mm -hmm. how I feel as a member of our community and a sense of belonging, but it's also gonna impact who I feel like I can work with, who I can truly give my opinion and constructive advice, share my wisdom with. Mm -hmm. um, and if we don't have those things to, on the table, if I feel like I can't be who I really am and I can't really share the knowledge I hold because you and I have these different viewpoints or these different expectations of the world, um, then we're not going to be able to solve these things that aren't based on just one knowledge area or one population. Um, and so I take that at the really meta level, um, but it, it's all, it flows all the way down to everything. For me, it's about the future of education. I mean, there's an amazing uh, teacher shortage right here in the state of Minnesota. I could name 10 teachers um, just in the last few months who have quit and resigned. Um, K-12 teachers, um, you know, I do have the protection of tenure, um, but there are ways in which it has become so difficult in the K-12 landscape or for higher education educators who don't have the protection of tenure to make these brave decisions. And who suffers are students. I really appreciate how John and Sandy have, you know, um, free speech at the crossroads. And at Carleton, we're at this co crossroads of talking about academic freedom. There's this false binary that's happening on our campus where academic freedom seems to be, for so many people, something that faculty want, but students don't understand how it protects them as well. So there's ways in which this is not just a guild right, it's not just I want to teach whatever I want to teach, however I want to teach it, regardless of what happens to you. Students are the biggest beneficiaries of academic freedom, and our students don't really see that yet. They see it as something that faculty are agitating for because we're tired of being so careful or tiptoeing around them. 
And what we need to do is to say that the quality of the education that they will receive, K through college, is really dependent on these kinds of academic freedoms. And, and by the way, can I just point, this isn't all about identity, right? Like, like a, a lot of these discussions that come down to identity, but it's not just about identity. You can have people that share the same identity and have radically different viewpoints, right? And I think that the association, that you assume you know everything about somebody because you know the one label about them, right? That's a very troubling problem. I, I think some of the most challenging questions I've ever been asked, for example, were from people who were uh, pacifists. Um, where they would ask questions like, you know, instead of that being violent, what if you had done this, right? What if 100,000 people had simply marched on Moscow, right? Would that resolve the war in Ukraine? I don't, I don't know, but it's a radically different viewpoint that I need to have thought about if I want to take myself seriously. Yeah, and the, another question that I feel like we can't leave this this panel without at least kind of facing head on, right? Which is the, the, the reputation right now of higher education is that it's this very liberal, skewing liberal, liberal place with the viewpoints of the faculty. And there's some you know, data out there that that is the identity of a lot of professors, um, certainly not all. So what, um, you know, how can, you know, that, Talk about that a little bit because there's this reputation somehow that the academy is is biased or leaning and that that has some effect. Um, what what are some thoughts there about about how that's playing out and and how do you react to those kinds of critiques that are coming out, um, Catherine? So I think of this visual representation uh, representation that I can't remember where I'm borrowing this from, but it's the idea of knowledge as a circle and that the smaller the circle, the less you're touching what you don't know. Mm -hmm. The larger your frame of knowledge, the more you're aware of what you don't know. And I think that is a big thing of that we are so lucky if you've, if, you know, to be in a higher education space. It means not only that we might have more information, but we're actually more aware of what we don't know. And I think that even in terms of thinking about research, right, when we, when we talk about research with our students, it's first asking the question. It's not coming in necessarily with the certainty of what's about to go in. I mean, sometimes we do that, but, you know, we really shouldn't. And I think that is the, the thing that I think about is, is when you are not certain, when you are questioning, when you are approaching things with curiosity, that's what uh, just creates a really different landscape than approaching things being 100% certain. And I think that's maybe, you know, I, not to get too political, like in terms of liberal, whatever, but if we really take it from a curiosity standpoint that we could be wrong, that there could be more to learn, and also that curiosity then means maybe I might change my stance. And I think that's what higher education does or should do, is say, what have you 100% believed in, and is there any curiosity that you might be shape shaping it in a different way? Um, so again, is that being liberal? I don't know. I definitely say it's progressive, because we are progressing from one idea, idea to another, and I don't feel shame in that idea. I mean, when you first asked the question, um, my smart aleck response was to say, so, yeah, that's great. I love, I love working in an in a environment with left-leaning people. Um, is that a problem that I want to fix? Well, the problem that I need to fix, I think, comes to thinking about the issue of ideology. So that if you know that your stance is your stance, a stance shared by others, but just a stance and not the truth, and it is a kind of ideology that we inhabit. When I talk to high school students about ideology, I say it's kind of like a salt perfume. The people who wear perfume when you walk into a, um, a, an elevator, they don't know that they're wearing too much perfume, right? A fish doesn't know that it's swimming in water. They just think that it's the truth. So I don't really want to necessarily fix our higher education institutions so that there's more of a balance between left-leaning people and other people. Sorry, that's not my goal. But my goal is to make sure that those left-leaning people make a space for a discussion of the fact that their stance where they land is ideological, is driven by a lot of different things, and there are other ways that equally smart and sensitive people 
can land in a different place. And those people are in our classrooms. And we need to give them the opportunity to articulate what they believe without feeling sh ashamed of it. Yeah, I'll, I'll throw in, I agree with all of that. I, I, I'll, I'll throw in one additional thing, which is that um, just because a person has a certain political viewpoint uh, in their personal life doesn't mean that that has to dominate the classroom. So I teach a number of classes where I represent many different viewpoints. Uh, and I try to make one of, th one of the most important things I think I can do, in fact, is to figure out where the sort of center of gravity, the political center of gravity is among a group of students, and then try to give them arguments that they probably have never heard before, probably have never thought about, and try to represent them in the most credible way and to give them readings to show these are very thoughtful, intelligent, knowledgeable people. Here's them representing a point of view that, y that doesn't agree with your point of view. Um, and that can all happen in the classroom regardless of the political party that the instructor belongs to. As a, as a journalist trying to be objective in things I cover, I relate to what you're saying. I mean, it's, it's basically separating the um, individuals from the job at hand, the task that you're doing, and training people, if I hear you correctly, all of you, right. in, in working through how to do your job. Um, in that, in that is the goal. Well, I did promise time for questions, and I want to make sure I do that. So, um, it, does anyone have one? If not, I have plenty more. Um, and um, <laughs> or maybe I'll give a beat for people to come to the mic. Um, one of the things, let's see, if there any brave souls who want to jump up um, while people are thinking of their. Oh, good. Um, do you want to come to the mic if you don't mind? Um, give everybody a moment to think through all the things we've heard. Okay. I want to thank you first uh, for a very enlightening and um, interesting set of approaches to really difficult questions. But as I was listening to you, I was thinking that viewpoint diversity is necessary, but it's really not enough if you're going to resolve arguments. You, you know, it's agree to disagree rather than how can we come to uh, some accommodation. And my, uh, my career included teaching ethics. Um, and it occurred to me that one of the things that we tried to do to deal with these problems was to think up to think down. And by that I mean take the problem, maybe it's welfare, maybe it's theft, whatever it might be, and get it up to a theoretical level where you can find people uh, of different viewpoints uh, agreeing on the basis on which the, discussion, the decision would be made. Uh, is it consequentialist? Is it the golden rule? But once you've got the discussion there, then you can think back down to try and solve the problem. And I would just encourage you to think about how you get people with different viewpoints to find a way to talk uh, on a common ground. So, does that make sense to you? I guess oh, it makes perfect question. sense. I mean, that's a fundamental concept in, in rhetoric and an argument that w there's the concept of stasis, uh, right, in which you're looking for a stasis point, and that usually should be the beginning point of the argument. So you start with what is it that we already agree on? And the, the best way is if those can, in, in debate, we refer to it as a framework. So we say, what criteria can we agree on that can frame how we are going to go about making a series of decisions? So that could be an ethical framework, but it could be a political framework, it could be a financial framework, right? But that we try to start the argument by figuring out what is the stasis point of agreement around a framework, and then we work towards trying to reach a conclusion to that argument that we think is the best conclusion. And, and I'll just point out, right, that sometimes having a good argument means that we all compromise, right? That we're all willing to, to yield a little bit to reach a point of view that we can all agree on. But sometimes that's not the best outcome to an argument. There are some kinds of arguments which are empirically true or empirically not true, and we have to work our way around to figuring out what is the most 
accurate answer, whether people like the answer or not is sometimes irrelevant, right? So you talk about medicine, you talk about uh, physics, right? It doesn't really matter whether you like the answer, uh, right? But we need the proper framework to get us to the most accurate answer. So both of those things are part of having a good argument. I, I wanna make sure we touch on this, this aspect too of, of when some arguments might be made that are just you know factually wrong as you brought up and we just went through this pandemic public health crisis where this was very real about how to inform people and how to you know um, work as a collective with science and, and research and medicine um, what how you know what we talked about media literacy not just being the answer or, or critical thinking but then how do we separate these things which are feel like you know everyone gets an opinion to things that are you know, factually true that then are you know, actionable that people need to, to kind of navigate the world um, successfully. <laughs> I don't know, it's a big question. Catherine, do you have any thoughts? No, that was already where I was thinking about going about how at one point, um, and I know it's so, it's so trite to go back to World War II, but it's just such a good example of like being a Nazi was viewpoint diversity at one point, and now <laughs> it's, 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 I hope, mostly accepted that that is wrong, right? Like, this is wrong to, um, to believe some of those beliefs. And I think that's some of the things I see at conflict with our students, is some people are saying this is viewpoint diversity, and some people are saying this is a fact, it's wrong. Um, and why are we even spending time having to discuss it? Um, the thing that I think we have to start thinking about, and I really love this idea of, well, where do we start off believing? We believe in humanity, and then work our way up from there. Where, where is it that we start to diverge? That I have started asking students, is when do we allow people to change? Mm. Is it, and I think that plays into cancel culture because I bet most of us in the room can think of one person that we believe does deserve to be canceled, right? Right, <laughs> maybe it is Hitler, you know, but there is, I bet we can think of someone. So is it really the issue is that we wanna cancel people sometimes or is the issue about how we allow people to change and grow? And I think that's something that I ask about with, with restorative justice is when, is there a chance for restorative justice? Now, whether or not someone takes it up on themselves to follow that path, that's on them, right? But do we immediately need to expel someone from society or from believing that they have value in a conversation, from believing that they might have a type of truth they can contribute? Like, at what point do we start saying, no, scientifically, this is truth and not truth? And the social pieces, right, the things that we've seen as humanities, there's a lot more gray area, and I think that's where we're struggling struggling um, with of being able to say to say those things. But I do think, when do we allow people to grow? And I, again, I think that goes into cancel culture. Is it the fact that at one point you believed this thing or is or is the issue that you're now still believing these things and have been unwilling mm -hmm. to, to consider other viewpoints to grow, to change? Part of it is also a pedagogical issue. How do you affirm students and at the same time be willing to, to let them know when they're wrong? Just yesterday in class, when we were talking about stage theories, I asked um, students if they knew what the word epigenetic meant. And one student, a philosophy major, said something that was like completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and he, was, he thought it was about eugenics, and he started talking about that. And I, you know, I had this moment after decades of teaching where it's like, you know, I want Kevin to feel comfortable in this class. I don't want to shame him. He's going to mislead 25 other students. I need to say, Kevin, thanks for playing. <laughs> I really appreciate your contribution. That's really not what epigenetic is. And part of this I blame on, you know, the K-12 reader response. You know, everyone has um, a response to something and that response is equally valid. Right. But the answer is not always equally valid. And it's really tricky to, on one hand, be able to encourage our students to grow and participate in our class, but to not mislead them with misinformation. And I think sometimes we opt out of that. Right, yeah, and I'll just throw, t I that was, yeah, that's great. I'll throw two other things in there. So one is that um, there's, an, there's an emotional posture that we need to train ourselves in and practice. Um, it's not something you can just flip on in a switch. It takes practice to make yourself open, both emotionally and intellectually open, 
to the possibility of being wrong. <laughs> and that's especially true in public, right? It's very hard to be open to the possibility of being wrong in public. And then the second piece is that those frameworks I was talking about, sometimes they're you know, specific, narrower frameworks, but there's also a larger framework that I think we kind of all need to buy into if we're going to engage in rational argument, which is like, what counts as evidence? What kind of evidence do we think is better than other kinds of evidence? Um, you know, learning enough at least about how logic works, uh, that we all think that you know, applying the rules of logic is a valuable thing to do. Um, those are things we used to have a consensus on, largely because, like, and I'm sorry, just, we all, we're all prisoners of our discipline, so we all speak from our discipline, right? But uh, we used to teach rhetoric as a huge part of the curriculum, both K-12 and higher ed, and now it's just a tiny little part, if at all. And, and as a result, I don't think we have that shared understanding of what, what does rationality look like? What does evidence look like? What counts as evidence? What's better evidence, right? And if we don't have that, then it's really, really hard to resolve those issues of what's factual. I see we have another question, and we're, we're near the end of time, but I definitely wanna, wanna give you the floor here. Hi, first of all, thank you for this conversation. I don't have a question. Um, I, I have plenty of questions, but I have a comment um, with regards to um, the conversation here, and it kind of speaks to what you just were talking about. Um, where is the interconnectedness of education? You're receiving 18, 19 year olds, and maybe some um, elders. Most of us educator, as a parent, I knew the first five years of my children's life where the, some of the most important parts where their brain was and their thinking was developing. Um, what is happening in K-12 is so different than what children are res as they enter education. So hearing so many teachers leaving because they're overwhelmed, um, some of the words and some of the important concept that came up here was competition. Competition is the new religion in school systems. Um, there is very little cooperation, so a lot of young kids don't know how to sit at a table and listen to each other. So we talk about debate. A part of, big part of debate is to listen to each other. I have never debated, so I don't know, but I have been at many circles, and if we're not there present to listen to each other, there is no way we actually have a conversation. And I'm here because I'm originally from Iran and I grew up in a Muslim culture. I don't look like a Muslim woman in America because America has already decided what a Muslim woman looks like. And my voice is never heard because again, once again, this country has decided who a Muslim woman is. Um, these conversations are difficult, but they are nuanced, and we, we are, this is an opportunity to start the conversation, but um, uh, the other word that I wrote here is shame. Um, teaching students not to shame each other and to actually listen to each other, we all, have emotions. I'm a product of uh, 40 years ago when I was at University of Minnesota as a woman, as a woman of a third world country, as a Muslim woman of a third world country in School of Architecture. Um, thoughts that were really based on a one book that my friends told me I should read, The Fountainhead. Um, <laughs> this is what we dealt with. Um, I am not angry. I have grown, to your point. When do we acknowledge that we're constantly changing? You know, so I've talked too much, but I wanted to make this comment with regards, in particular from the reason why I'm here is because Islam is highly misunderstood and Muslim women like me who want, who know that the hijab is, is a cloth that keeps a lot of women down outside of this country. Perhaps it's a choice here. Outside of this country, hijab is a political uh, piece of cloth keeping women voices and their lives at stake. So um, just keep, keep 
keeping this conversation and coming to the table, intergenerational, and even bringing teachers from K to 12 to be a part of this conversation because you are receiving all those children. Thank you. Thanks, that's a, a wonderful challenge and, and frame, framing to end on. Thank you for sharing that. Now, do I, can I ask one more question? We're sort of over time, or? We have to finish the whole morning at noon. Okay, so I, how about this? Everybody can, let's do a quick thing to end on. Everybody, if you could have a 30 second response or less, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, so what is, you know, what would you leave folks with? That if you had a magic wand to, to sort of address any part of what we've talked about today, is there kind of one thing, one thought you'd like to leave us with? Um, we can start on this end here. Um, Sure, I, I'd say, I would say to people generally what I say to my students, which is that being wrong is the greatest thing in the world for learning. There is no better, in fact, there is no way to learn without being wrong a lot, repeatedly, over and over again. And so being open to the possibility of being wrong, I think, is the starting point, it is the mental, emotional starting point, which opens a person up to both learning and building relationships, and then you don't fear disagreement. For the most part, we fear disagreement and we fear argument because we fear being wrong, and we don't wanna give up some belief that we've held for a long time. But if you have an emotional posture where you're open to the possibility of being wrong, um, that opens up so many doors for learning and growth and building new relationships through disagreement. I know I get to preach to the choir about cognitive dissonance and the mm. importance of that. But I do think that in soon affairs, we talk a lot about a theory about challenge and support. And you add in that framework of readiness, right? If you're not ready to be supported, if you're not ready to be challenged, you don't. Mi you might not be ready for that cognitive dissonance. Um, but I do think this idea of viewpoint diversity, it's, it's because how do people step into it and allow themselves to step back and have, as what I called earlier, the dance of in and out, because you need restorative time. You need times when you're in enclaves that reflect who you are only, but you also need times where you can be in and, and be challenged to yeah. think about other things. Um, Catherine talked earlier about the ethic of care, which is something that I think should be woven all the way through our enterprise, but the ethic of care does not exist in opposition to challenging our students to saying the things that go without saying. In fact, I think challenging them is actually the greatest gesture of care that we respect our students enough to challenge them. But in order to make that happen, we have to build the kind of trust mm -hmm. with them and with each other that yes, I think we may be sorely lacking. Well, thanks. Um, please join me in thanking our panelists for sharing and, and doing this today.